You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 15. First foods are the foundation of a healthy child with Karen Ansel. In this episode, I'm chatting it up with Karen Ansel, registered dietitian, speaker, journalist, and author of the Baby and Toddler Cookbook, Fresh Homemade Foods for a Healthy Start. Karen is a go-to resource for the media. Her expert nutrition advice appears in leading magazines, websites, and newspapers nationwide, such as the Wall Street Journal, People, U.S. News and World Report, ABC News, Fox News, WebMD, Women's Day, Red Book, Health, Fitness, Shape, Self, and you name it, she is in it. I am extremely pleased to have her as a guest on the show today. We discuss baby food, toddler food how to introduce it, how to make it, and how to set your child up for a future of health and loving the food they eat. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey everyone, it's Jill Castle. Hope you're all doing well. I'm excited to be with you today. I have some uh, a great guest on the show today who's going to be talking about baby and toddler food, which couldn't really come at a better time if you've been listening to the media, on social media particularly, or even just keeping up with all the research. There is a lot going on in the infant feeding world today. There are a lot of trends that are happening. There are a lot of new approaches to feeding your baby, including a lot of opinions about what is the best way to feed your baby. So you know me, I definitely take the nutrient adequacy route when I am thinking about anything for children. So when it comes to the first year of life, baby food, solid food, purees versus handheld solids, my bend will always, always be what is the most nutrient adequate diet for your baby. I feel very strongly about that because in that first two years of life, there's enormous amount of change going on in your baby's body. Not only is the body growing, which is so very obvious to see externally, but there is a lot going on inside your child's brain. And that really relies on adequate nutrition. So it's very important that however you decide to feed your baby, whether it be with a spoon or with solid foods, that you keep in mind that the nutrients that your child is receiving is really bottom line, the most important thing. I tackled that a little bit in a previous episode on the Nourish Child called Top Nutrients Your Baby Needs. And I believe that was episode number five. So you'll be able to find it at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 005 for episode five. Again, that was Top Baby Nutrients Parents Need to Watch. And in that episode, I do go over the different nutrients that I feel are the most important for your baby in the first year or two of life. Because infant nutrition is so important, I wanted to have a special guest on today who has written a cookbook for babies and toddlers. So she has really done a great job of focusing on flavor, nutrients, and ease for you moms and dads out there who are thinking about doing more homemade baby food or homemade solid foods for your infant or toddler. So before I get Off on a tangent here talking about infant nutrition, I want to welcome you to the show. I want you to understand where you can find the show notes, which are, this is going to be episode 15, so you'll find the show notes at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 015. That's 15, 015 for episode 15. So without further ado, let's get this podcast rolling with my interview with Karen Ansel registered dietitian and author of the Baby and Toddler Cookbook. Hey, Karen, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Jill? I'm good. Thank you so much for being on the Nourished Child podcast. I'm so glad you're here. 
So glad to be here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I love your book, The Baby and Toddler Cookbook, Fresh Homemade Foods for a Healthy Start. And I'm so excited that you're here to talk about that today and share with my listeners all the good advice you have about baby food and making it and all the scrumptious recipes that can be had. I don't think that parents necessarily realize how creative they can get for their baby and their toddler. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. I think for such a long time, you know, we just thought that baby food has to be something that comes out of a jar. But really, the best food that you can make or give your baby is the food that you make yourself because you know exactly what goes into it. So you can be really confident about what your baby's eating. And also because it's fresher, it just tastes better. Yeah, I know. And I've noticed in the in just the commercial baby food world, they're they're coming up with some new ways to make the food so that it does look as fresh as homemade and it's as colorful and that that is something that I think homemade baby food has definitely had over what's been available in the grocery stores is just how fresh it looks. Exactly. And then the other wonderful thing about it too is that you can modify the food as your baby matures to go with every age and stage. So while the food might start out very thin, as your baby gets older and starts to be able to handle more texture, you can slowly add that in. So you can have the food evolve with every stage that your baby is at. Yeah, that's what's so great. And I'm sure we'll talk about this in a little bit, but just you can really add a lot of different flavors to just very plain foods as your baby gets older too. So you can really expand that flavor palette in some really creative ways. Yes, definitely. And I mean, that's one of the things too about baby food is we've always thought that babies need to eat this incredibly bland food. And while you certainly don't want to overwhelm a baby who's just starting solids with all kinds of flavors, pretty quickly you can start to make that food very, very interesting for them. And you're really shaping their palate from day one. So by working on all these interesting flavors, it's just going to overall throughout their lives make them a much more adventurous and well-rounded eater. I couldn't agree more. And I know that there's a lot of research coming out in that flavor profile development and what that looks like early on when you're offering baby lots of different flavors. But but really what it translates to later in life is a less pickier eater. That's what the research is showing, which is so incredible. Now, before we dig in, and I know we just have just kind of started to dig in, it gets, it's such an exciting topic, but I want to know a little bit about you. Tell the listeners about, you know, who you are, what you do, where you come from, do you have some little people in your life, all those goodies people like to know about my guests. Sure. I'm um, a registered dietitian, and I've been a registered dietitian for 15 years, although i um, Dietetics is actually my third career, so I Mm. bounced around quite a bit before I got here, but it's definitely the one that stuck. And as a dietitian, I focus my efforts on writing, just sharing all kinds of nutrition knowledge for people out there who want to know more. Not everybody can really meet with a registered dietitian, so I like to be able to reach people through what I write, and I write um, for magazines. So I'm a contributing editor to Women's Day, but I also write for many others, such as Eating Well and Women's Health. I just have an article out this month actually in Yoga Journal. Um, So I write for a really wide variety of magazines. I also have written several books. Um, In addition to the one we're talking about now, my fourth book is coming out in January, and that's actually the opposite end of the spectrum. It's called Healing Superfoods for Anti-Aging. So it's really about how as you get older, you can also eat to enhance your health. So I really like to touch on all aspects of healthy eating for all ages. Yes, yes. That's so exciting. A fourth book. That's wonderful. Yeah, I can't wait. Oh, my gosh. That's so great. And uh, yeah, younger. That's a that's an enticing topic to me, too. Yes, it is. <laughs> So I know in the Baby and Toddler Cookbook, you do spend some time in the book talking about easing into toddlerhood with food. So explain a little bit about what you mean by that. Yeah, what happens is, you know, when we first start to, when we're first starting babies on solids and they're about six months old, they're usually very eager to eat and they're growing very quickly. So once they get the hang of eating solids, it's really, you know, hopefully not that much of a struggle that they are hungry all the time and they want to eat. But as babies start to hit that toddler stage, their growth slows down. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden they're not 
is hungry all the time and their eating habits become more erratic. They might be starving one day and then another day they have little interest in food. So you really have to approach that stage keeping that in mind. So you don't want to be, you know, really pressuring them to eat. You really want to keep in mind that they can meet their needs over a course of a few days that if they don't eat everything in one meal or even a day, it's really not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and then also to realize that you have to kind of hand over the reins a little bit, that they're becoming more independent and learning to feed themselves. So you want to ease into that transition as well. And um, also easing into the transition from bottle to cup, mm -hmm. that they should be, you know, this is a good time to um, wean your baby off of a bottle, or if the baby's breastfed, to offer them a cup in addition, and to also make the transition from the fact that maybe a lot of their diet had a lot of liquids in it in the form of formula or breast milk, and now it's going to you know, hopefully contain more solid food. So there's a lot going on in that transition. So you don't want to kind of try to tackle it all at once. You want to realize that it's a process and it takes time mm -hmm. and there will be good days and there will be bad days. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that you said that is really important to sort of re-emphasize to some of the listeners is that I find too in my own practice and working with families that there's this idea that, you know, in the first year of life, baby's growth is so rapid and, you know, everything's changing and, and a baby's palate is totally blank and they're really accepting of nearly everything. And so you have this, I call it the honeymoon period, where your baby in the first year of life is just a champion eater, like everything you introduce is a right. success. And then you hit that second year and it's like you hit the skids. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> I know your toddler doesn't have as much of an appetite. Their growth slows down. They want to be more independent, have more say in what they're wanting to eat. And they start to fear food and reject it and get on these jags. And yeah, I, I love how you say ease into toddlerhood. I think that that's really important that yes, as you said, a lot of changes are happening. And if you go into it thinking you're going to get everything done all at once, or you're too emotionally wrapped up in what your baby used to be like in the first year of life, you're going to be very disappointed. I think easing into it with that open mind that a lot of changes are happening and uh, you don't need to rush it. But there are things that you do need to get done in that second year of life. There are goals. And one of them, as you mentioned, is really expanding that flavor palette. So I'm curious to know, and I'm sure my listeners are too, what sort of ways would you suggest via food, and I'm sure you have some recipes in your book that sort of showcase this, but how would you suggest a parent really build on that flavor exposure? Well, I think the first is to think of children of all ages as children who can eat what we eat, that there shouldn't be, you know, one thing that really makes me cringe is when I go out to a restaurant and I see a kid's menu, that kids do not need different food than adults. That doesn't mean that they might be ready for everything, you know, for eating five spice chili. They may not be ready for that, but that doesn't mean that they can't eat chili. So I, I think the first thing is to think about the fact that you want to offer them all different kinds of flavors and assume that they are going to, within a short period of time, be eating what you eat. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you have to respect the fact that, you know, all of us have foods that we like and don't like, right? So I'm sure you have some foods that you don't like and you wouldn't want somebody to pressure you to eat those. But to realize that they're probably going to eat most foods, maybe not all of them. Mm -hmm. And then in doing that, you want to be able to make their food interesting. So, you know, give them all kinds of food. So rather than just giving them, you know, hamburger or something like that, to, to make something like chili or spaghetti with meatballs and really to think of foods, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of with the book is that it offers a lot of meals for um, babies as they get older, certainly toddlerhood and on, that an entire family can eat. And I think that's the goal is that maybe you might take a little bit of a food that you're eating, you know, if you're making something for the whole family and you're going to spice it up, you might put a certain amount in, take some out for your baby, and then maybe make it spicier or more flavorful for the whole family. Mm -hmm. But with the goal that eventually your child is going to end up eating exactly what you eat, that you're never going to have to make you know three different meals at dinner time, that it's going to be one meal for the whole family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Really good point. And then what in terms of getting started with 
baby food. Let's just talk baby food for a second because I think a lot of parents uh, can be a little bit overwhelmed with the idea of making baby food. And of course, you know, you can go super simple like mashing an avocado or a banana. That's about the simplest baby food you can make, right? Homemade. But what would you, what advice would you give or your top tips you would give to a parent who is wanting to get started on making homemade baby food? Well, my top tip would be, you know, being a parent, especially if you're a first-time parent, there's a lot going on. It can be very overwhelming. So I, my top tip would be don't feel that you need to do this every single day if it is not something that fits in with your schedule. To do it when you can, as often as you can, in a way that's comfortable for you. So certainly what you said is, you know, some of the foods that are best raw, like avocados and bananas, great. But also making really, really simple purees and making them in bulk when you're first starting. So you could puree, you know, you could cook apples or pears and puree them in a food processor or a blender and just take a little out for the next, you know, maybe a couple of days for your baby and then take the rest and freeze it in ice cube trays and store it in your freezer and take it out and thaw it as needed. Mm -hmm. And if you can do this a few times a week, you'll actually build up very quickly a rotation of homemade purees. So it's not like you're having to cook three meals a day every meal, that eventually you might have some applesauce in your freezer and you might also have some winter squash and you might also have a pea puree and you'll have all different kinds of things to go ahead and pull from. Um, The other thing a lot of times people don't realize is that you can also freeze whole grains. As a matter of fact, these freeze are really beautiful. Mm. So if you're making something like brown rice, or quinoa, that you can also take that and freeze that as well. So you can have a really, really nice rotation of foods without having to knock yourself out on a daily basis. Well, that is awesome. I didn't really ever think about freezing whole grains, but yes, of course, that makes total sense. And man, if you're a mom and you're just making the meal for your family, I think, can't you take part of that out and and blend it up and stick it in the ice cube trays and, and do it that way as well? Definitely. And the other thing to realize, too, is that while your baby's going to be eating these pureed foods, this is only going to be for a couple of months. Very quickly, that baby's going to advance on to chunkier textures. So it's not like you're going to be, you know, pureeing all these things forever. Eventually, it is just going to be a matter of more of taking out what you're making for your family and maybe just modifying the consistency a little bit as your child gets older. Mm -hmm. That makes me think of uh, pureeing meats. And I think about that because I'm pretty focused on matching nutrient needs for baby in the first year. And I usually, for me as a professional, I let that sort of guide my recommendations. And I know, and I'm, I'm certain you know too, Karen, that iron and zinc are so important in that first yes. year of life. And one of the barriers that I see for parents and not even just a barrier but one of some one of the practices that I see happening is that parents are avoiding meat in that first year of life and and it's not that they're avoiding it on purpose it's just that I think it's something that's hard for them to figure out how to prepare and how to get the consistency right for their child be it pureed or even you know, now there a lot of uh, families are trying the baby led weaning uh, approach where a child would eat a stick of meat. And for that, you know, again, that meat needs to be so incredibly tender so yes. that the child can consume it without choking or or at least consume it, not just the juice of it, but consume the meat so that they get the benefits of the iron and the zinc. So, you know, do you have recommendations for preparation of meat, be it, you know, if a mom wants to puree it or serve it as a solid food? Definitely. And and definitely the consistency is a concern. For example, steak would be way too tough and chewy for, um, you know, a baby or maybe even a toddler, depending on where they're at. So you definitely want to start with very, very soft meats and you want to be able to puree them fully, um, early on. And one of the easiest ways to do that, even though, you know, I'm not recommending that people go out and eat lots of hamburgers, but any kind of ground meat, and this could also be also turkey, dark meat turkey is Mm -hmm. a tremendous source of iron. Um, So that's a good choice as well. But any kind of ground beef, ground lamb, ground turkey purees really, really well. Mm -hmm. And then from the opposite end of the spectrum, 
if you're going to, if you do want to make some kind of meat for your family, a dish, any kind of meat that you would stew, if you can cook that meat until it is really tender and falling apart, that will puree really easily as well. Mm -hmm. So you want those long cooking meats rather than something that you would just throw on the grill that's going to be very chewy and bouncy and probably will not puree at all. So Mm -hmm. it's a matter of the cut that you choose. But um, it's definitely important to work these foods into your baby's diet at the beginning and to realize that, you know, they're they're one of many foods um, and to not get all bogged down with all kinds of food fads that we're hearing about, but to keep their diet really, really well-rounded with lots of different foods. So it's not a matter that you're going to concentrate on, you know, one small group that you're going to want to give them really, you know, whole grains, lean meats, um, full fat dairy as they get older, and all kinds of fruits and vegetables. And beans too, actually. Beans are a great choice for babies. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we don't think of that, but that's also a wonderful food for them. Mm -hmm. Beans were one of my children's first finger foods. (laughs) Once they got the... They're yeah, so easy to pick up. Yes, once you get the pincer grasp, it's they're very easy to pick up and just ran, rinse off the canned beans and and uh, you're good to go. Just a follow up question on the beef: Do you do you puree that with water or broth or what would you suggest a parent puree their beef with? You know, it really depends. With broth, you definitely can add broth, and broth will add flavor, but broth can have a lot of sodium, so it's just a matter of finding the right kind of broth that you might want to take your time shopping at the supermarket to find one that does not have a lot of added sodium um, and potentially all kinds of additives. So something that has has a short ingredient list. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't want to go the broth route, a little bit of water would be fine too, because you're going to, you're not going to need a real lot of this. It's just enough to make it smooth. So you're just Mm -hmm. talking a couple of tablespoons. Okay. Okay. Good. And one of the other things that came to mind is uh, even last night I made a I made beef in the crock pot, which I have that recipe on my blog. But the meat is so tender; it just yeah. fork shreds so easily. And I think even you know that would probably be great pureed, but also great as a solid food for a toddler who might be a little not aversive to meat, but who might have some trouble chewing those tougher textures. And I think actually, I think that's why a lot of toddlers won't eat meat is because it's just too tough. It's it's difficult to chew and uh, to consume. So that's a, also a nice uh, way to prepare the meat is in the crock pot. And yes, definitely. So easy. So easy. You don't even have to think about it. Right. All right. So moving on to the toddler, what considerations or insight would you give a mom or a dad of a toddler who's looking to make more homemade versions of of food rather than relying on some of the common pre-prepared foods that toddlers tend to eat? Well, I I think, again, that it's more a matter of at this point that the toddler years are where you're going to want to move on to more of the foods that you're eating, but -hmm. potentially a simplified version. So, for example, a toddler could have salmon cakes. You know, really, it could be Many of the foods that parents are eating, as long as they're not too, as we were talking about with the meats, as long as they're not, you know, I would be more concerned at that stage more than anything else about choking hazards. So you definitely don't want, as you're thinking about moving toward foods that the family's eating, that you don't want things that are going to be very chewy. Um, And also to keep in mind that your toddler is going to be a little more wary, as we were saying before, of newer foods. So you really want to work with your toddler to help introduce these foods in a way that, um, you know, when they're being picky, it's not going to be as much of an issue. So I really love the idea of introducing new foods with old foods. So Mm -hmm. it's not like we're going to bring out, you know, when I said salmon cakes, salmon cakes, and that's going to be it, that there will be plenty of foods or a few foods on the table that the toddler is used to as well. So it's more like, you know, here, try a piece of this. And I would really offer these foods in a very low pressure environment that your child you know, I've heard many times that it takes, I don't even know what the number is, sometimes people say five, ten, whatever, tries to get your child to like a new food. Um, my kids are older, they're teenagers, and I like to say it takes like ten years. And it, really does, <laughs> and it takes actually even more, I find. That, um, you really have to think super long term mm-hmm. in terms of raising a healthy eater. That the, the kids and babies and um, tweens and teens that they all go through stages and these they they go through them and they come out of them and the toddler stage is the very first of many 
that you're going to encounter. So it's kind of like, oh, you know, my child doesn't like this today and doesn't like it tomorrow. It's possible they'll like it in a year. So I would offer it, but I wouldn't get too concerned or upset if they're not eating it. Um, just make sure that there's lots of other foods that they like on the table too, so that it's a low pressure environment because you really want mealtime to be a happy time. You know, it's not just about food. Mealtime is about bonding and spending time with your family and connecting. So the food mm -hmm. is only one part of it. And I think if mealtimes are happy times, you're more likely over time to have um, an eater who is more adventurous because it's not going to be a stressful event in their life. Right, right. So salmon cakes over chicken nuggets. That sounds right. pretty darn good to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the other thing, too, is I would advise is, is to try to, you know, you really don't need to go for those um, kind of quote unquote kitty foods. It doesn't need to be about, you know, about chicken nuggets and hot dogs. I mean, really, there's no reason that kids need these foods at all. And, you know, whatever healthy habits you start earlier or fewer bad habits you're going to have to try and break later on. Mm -hmm. That's a good that's a good little tweetable right there. All right. So when you were writing the book, I'm sure you had some favorite recipes that you loved and couldn't wait to develop and share with everybody. Tell us what those were. The first thing I have to do is I have to give credit for the recipes. I did not develop them. Um, I'm the co-author of the book. So the recipes were developed by my co-author Charity Fiera, mm -hmm. who um, does all kinds of recipe development for her books and magazines, and she is a whiz in the kitchen. And she came up with amazing, amazing recipes. And many of them I particularly love because they're family friendly. Again, it's not something just that you're making for your baby or toddler. This is something that everybody can eat. And they have all kinds of interesting flavors and textures. So a few of mine are the ones just that you know you might make on any given night for any age group, like the pumpkin risotto, I love. The avocado and egg spread is great for lunch. And again, this is something that you could sit down and eat with your child. And I guess that's also, you know, a, a big part of raising that healthy eater is in the end, I really do believe more than anything else that your kids end up eating what you eat. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating this with them, if you're just eating it like you love it, they are going to be much more receptive to it. And end up liking it. Whereas if you are trying to get them to eat something that you're not eating, that's a really, really hard sell. Yeah. <laughs> um, really. So, so also other things I love that the whole family can eat are the cheesy calzones or the lasagna roll ups. You know, many of us have kids who are, they're not all the same age, right? You might have a baby, but you might also have a seven year old and a nine year old. So this way everybody can be eating the same thing. Right, right. That's good. That's a really good piece of advice. I think that you know, one of the one of the things that parents are challenged by is, you know, they have this ideal of what they want their kids to eat. They it's this almost fairy tale idea of the perfect healthy eater. And you make such a great point when you say, if you want your child to eat green beans, you need to be sitting there and eating green beans too. Oh, you uh, got to sell it. Gotta you do. you got to do the soft sell, right? right. Yes. <laughs> The hard sell never works. <laughs> well, Karen, it's been such a joy to have you on the show. Where can parents find your book and find out about you? And um, I know you write a blog as well, and I'm sure listeners will want to tap into all your resources. Well, they can find out more about me at my website, which is www.karenansell.com. And as for the book, they can find that on Amazon. And also on my website, there is a link to the Amazon page for the book, too. Awesome. And I am going to really look forward to your new book coming out. I'm going to have to Thank nab you. that one. Thanks. <laughs> Karen, thanks so much. Have an awesome day. And again, appreciate so much you being here. You too, Jill. It was great talking with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone, that's a wrap. Thank you so much to Karen Ansel, the author of the Baby and Toddler Cookbook. So interesting to hear her take on really how simple and easy it can be to make baby food in any shape or form and toddler food be a really healthy option for your child in those first couple of years of life and how to integrate those foods 
into your whole family's diet so everybody's eating the same stuff. Makes it a whole lot easier, doesn't it? I also want to just mention that I have some exciting guests coming up on the show. I've I'm interviewing Sally Kuzemchek from Real Mom Nutrition and have a whole bunch of other people lined up for you. So you're going to start hearing, you'll still hear from me, but you're also going to start hearing uh, from some other experts in the nutrition field and other related industries, because I think that just makes for great, rounded uh, show and perspective for you as you're raising your child. So don't forget to head over to my website to get show notes at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 015. That's 015 for episode 15. If you enjoyed today's episode, there are a few things you can do to help the Nourished Child podcast grow. Write a review on iTunes. You can subscribe to the show also on iTunes or on Android. I'm on Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. And also, if you can share the podcast on social media, that would be just fabulous. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, wherever you hang out, let your peers know about the Nourished Child podcast. The more parents that know about the show, the more informed and better at nourishing their child they will be. As always, thanks for joining me today. I am so very glad you were here. Please be sure to give that child in your life, big or small, a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourished Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.